Um, okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on the part of the world you are joining us from. I am Mazichika Austin and um, we are here once again this evening to look at uh, various developments in our world various development, a lot of things have been ongoing, there have been uh, <clears throat> various developments in our world, but I strongly believe that uh, someone out there um, is receiving me loud and clear, very important, sorry, let me see how to get, okay, then this should be, um, Bit better. So our world, there is a, a lot of developments in our world and for some reasonable number of time I've not been here on this um, outlook owing to the fact to some circumstances uh, beyond my own control and uh, we are here once again uh, having be out of this electronic space uh, within a defined time. And we're here once again to look at issues as, uh, uh, as a lot of things are going on in our own space. I'm talking about within the space of uh, Biafran land, Africa, and of course, the global stage. I would like love to confirm from us if we are coming out loud and clear. If you are receiving us loud and clear, uh, do notify us, do put us on notice to that respect and believe us, we are going to move on a speed because obviously uh, the world is on a speed lane and every single thing is happening very uh, jet speed. But nevertheless, it's very, very important to understand that whatever is happening before us today um, is a history making. Make no mistake about that. Because I have a couple of things I would love to talk about, specifically the struggle of Biafra, the current um, DSS recklessness and misbehavior. And uh, somehow, by extension, we are going to also look at the ongoing crisis happening in Europe, especially uh, Eastern Europe, so to say, which is threatening global peace and security. So these are the things we are going to look um, into you know, this evening, very, very important, um, very, very important. So we understand things that are happening. But before that, take note for this. I've, yes, it is true, I've been off this space talking about visual, visual uh, absence in terms of but, uh, visual, you know. But that doesn't mean I've been out of this space in terms of looking at a lot of things happening on social media, various comments, various commentaries, various opinions, um, all sort of, you know, opinionated write-ups. And believe you me, some I read, I, I wave it off. Some I read, I also um, see the need or wish I can, you know, give a direction, or should I say, give out, dish out a little information at my disposal so that we can understand things very well how they are moving. Um, somebody said to me, uh, of course, uh, somebody said to me, recently said to Austin, with all these things happening 
on the international stage. And mind you, for those of us who say, uh, there is no how you should be talking about the Russian-Ukraine crisis when the Biafra issue is concerned. That is the most, you know, insincere narrative we are making because the world is interconnected. The world is so interconnected that an activity is happening in one cardinal point of the world is influential to another cardinal point of the world. Because, you know, there is this an attempt by some of us, which I don't see it as a, a bad woman anyway, but I see it as us not really being exposed on the connectivities of the world, how the world is so connected that if something is happening, for example, in Libya, definitely is going to affect the global economy, it's going to affect the global energy. And in as much as it affects global trade and commerce, believe you me, it affects every citizen, citizen of the globe, directly or indirectly. So, the issue happening in Eastern Europe, talking about Russia and Ukraine crisis, also have influence. It's going to have influence on our own agitation. I'm going to explain. Because the truth is that we are getting to a point that global energy is going high. I don't want to start with Russia. I want to start with our struggle, but I'm trying to, you know, clear a foundation before so many of us who don't really understand how interconnected the global activities are. We start saying, ah, why are we talking about this? Now, let me give you an instance. What is happening in Russia, as I speak to you currently, has affected global oil price. And because it has skyrocketed, uh, it has skyrocketed the price of oil in international market, Nigeria is an oil buying nation. Nigeria buys oil. And because Nigeria needs oil, because Nigeria does not refine, she is, you know, exploits the natural resources, which is the good export for refining, then buys the finished product. Now, because Nigeria is a energy consuming, you should understand what I'm talking about. Because Nigeria buys the finished products, in the OPEC market. What is happening in Eastern Europe is going to affect Nigeria foreign reserve because Nigeria buys those oil with her wealth. So if the oil price is going high, it's not to the advantage of the Nigerian state. It is to her own disadvantage and because she will struggle in order to generate money. Remember, she's buying all these products. And these products she's buying, she subsidizes their price. What I mean by this, in a common uh, explanation, is this. If today, um, um, oil price is sold at, let's get, let's be factual here and understand how these things work. If today, let's assume the uh, price of uh, oil today, or as of this moment, you know, um, let's assume price of oil as of um, this very moment is $100. Sorry, above hundred dollars, and you know because it has surged as a result of the crisis in Middle East. Nigeria is not an oil refining state. 
she buys. Nigeria has to now, if she has done her budget for this year, without foreseeing this crisis that just developed, I'm trying to connect, interlink the strong factors that hold both the crisis in Russia, sorry, in Ukraine, with every single thing we are doing, including the agitation, we are strongly pressing home. So because the oil price has surged above $100, remember Nigeria buys the finished product. And let's assume Nigeria being under heavy economic mess, she is currently is, decided to say, okay, our benchmark to buy this finished product is $70. And out of this $70, remember she subsidized a certain amount. The government brings it certain amount and said to those who are the marketers, if this thing is going to cost you $70, okay, let me, let's assume you, you buy at $70, which means you're going to sell a liter, maybe 300. That is what it's supposed to be. Now, the government is saying, sell to an average Nigeria 200 naira. We are going to be paying 100, the 100 naira making it 300. That is what the subsidy is all about. And all of a sudden, the same government that have budgeted to be spending 100 naira subsidy, all of a sudden, now see a surge, high demand, high price, I mean to say, of the oil. What do you think will happen? She will be in a very big mess. And because Nigeria is in a very big economic mess, most of us don't understand how this is. Where she is running to for financial help, those people are already channeling their resources with what is to come out from this crisis. Nigeria is bleeding. Her budget, she is hoping to go and seek loan from Europe, to seek loan from China, to seek aid from other Western countries. And these Western countries, as I'm speaking to you, have decided to allocate more than 40% of their resources in preparation of the next stage of the crisis in Ukraine. All of them are now pumping huge amount of equipments and finances within the NATO bloc. China on herself is trying to also buckle up ahead of what is to come. In. Every single nation that have one or two alliances that would have giving this money to Nigeria to help herself from the deep mess she is, is currently preparing herself for what is to come, the next stage of this crisis. So if Nigeria, that is in a normal global atmosphere, is in a mess, that is asking for help, for bailout, for economic bailout, how do you think Nigeria will survive when those that would have helped her are now preoccupied with the current international development. So you can now understand when some people um, try to say um, the country, <laughs> you see, it, you need to just be on a high mental exposure for you to understand how the whole thing works. The truth is, every country needs a sound economy, sound resources, either internally generated or externally supported to survive. It's so unfortunate to the Nigerian state that currently, those who would have helped her are in a serious external engagement, external preparation for the next stage of the crisis. For your information, if you think that what is happening in Ukraine is going to stop in the next three months, you're kidding. And that is where most of us don't understand how the world runs. I don't want to dive, dive into it now because I really want the Biafran people to understand. 
the next stage of where the whole development is going to land us. Because as I speak to you, in a sh no short distant time, <laughs> there is going to be a very natural outburst in Nigeria. Because as I speak to you, Nigeria is suffering on importation, how to import the cost, high cost product, petroleum product, because the pro uh, petroleum products have increased, the price has increased, because the price has increased, a broke, financially broke Nigeria is on the disadvantage. She's on the disadvantage because she does not refine, as you mean she refines the, the raw material to finish product, she would have been on an advantage. Even though she's not going to be on advantage in terms of external exchange, she will be on advantage based on internal energy security. You can now understand what we're talking about. But as I speak to you, the raw material exporting nation called Nigeria that buys the finished product is she now woke up to now realize that the certain amount she provided to buy this product for 2022 budget is nowhere close to what these products are being sold as a result of the crisis in Ukraine. So the, the country is going to face a severe crisis, energy crisis. That is one. Two, over 60% of Nigerian budget is being financed by loan. Countries fund this budget because of the economic epileptic state of the Nigerian state. Now, unfortunately to the Nigerian state, those countries that needed to have assisted in cushioning this budget deficit are all champions. They are all in preparation over the demand of their rules in the next stage of the crisis in Ukraine. China is seriously withdrawing back resources home because of what is to come. The NATO nations are also withdrawing resources home to, for what is to come. Russia and all the rest of them, Turkey, India, name them. Every single donor nation is now restricting exportation of wealth because they know that this is just the preamble stage of the crisis. So now, so many of us will now understand why Nigeria has to go animalistic, why Nigeria has to go defensive, and of course, miscalculatively in handling the issue of Biafra. You see, when a country is faced, take note so that you understand the realities on ground. Having analyzed all these factors facing the Nigerian state, two options are left for them to survive. One is either they fail to take control. When I mean take control, I mean start putting up every dictatorial tendencies. If they fail to put up every dictatorial tendencies, they are going to have the country naturally collapse. Because by the time they are unable to face the armed well, pay the armed forces and other security agencies, including other responsibilities of the government, people will naturally devote. So what the Nigerian state is now trying to do is this. Look at what the cabals are trying to work out for themselves. All they are not trying to do is that. Let us see how to pick up various voices. Those individuals we know that they have the capability to conscientize the people on what is going to happen. 
So don't be surprised any moment from now you will see severe picking up of opposition voices because the country is in a very big mess, severe mess. Either they go extreme dictatorial or they watch things collapse before the America. It's an inevitable factor. It's a phenomenon before them. So when you see them trying to see, trying to devise a new undemocratic approach in handling that dictators are fear, it's because of fear. Because in what is to come, they don't need to have a free opposition voices that will organize and galvanize the people, conscientize the people against their failures. And what they are trying to worry when you see them say, oh, don't visit Mazenam the Kano, come today, come tomorrow, all this, you see them picking showere, you see them doing this, all these are geared towards the fears of tomorrow. Because they, they have watched the statistics, it's inevitable. They have watched the permutation, there's no power, they can literally escape from it. Because those countries that would have helped to stabilize Nigeria are in a very serious demand to focus to Eastern Europe. And I want to say this for you to understand or for you to take hope. You see, the best thing that would have happened to the Nigerian state, let's not listen very attentively. The best thing that would have happened to the Nigerian state, as I speak to you currently, would have been if there is a national cohesion, a national harmony between the other Nigerians against the Biafra population. I repeat, the best thing that would have happened to the Nigerian state is this. Had it been there is a national consensus, there is a national harmonization between the rest of Nigeria against the Biafra. It could have been an easy task for them to manage. All they would have done is seize this opportunity of global distractions and attention to, you know, uh, activate military onslaught against the Biafra people. But why that choice is so difficult for them to implement is because Mazen Namdekano and the Biafran agitators, the generality of the Biafran agitators, took time to put these deep scissors among the rest of Nigerians. So when you don't have a common cohesion, common factor, common front, you cannot have a common vision. If it were to be before, that the North Lani Nigerians so if it were before that the North Lani Nigerians you know uh, are united it could have been uh, should I say sorry Let me tell this person so that I uh, speak with him. I will call you in a few minutes. Uh, so, um, sorry for that. I need to get that so that I stop the. Yeah. So, if it. Shit. So, if it were to be before, you know, when the non Fulani Nigerians were not conscientized. We are not mentally programmed to the right way of thinking. It could have been the right time for Nigeria to do her dirty job, which is invading Biafra land. Because currently, the world is, in the next few weeks, what you're going to see is a, a high concentration in Eastern Europe. Because, for your information, if you think that the NATO Forces are going to back down. You're kidding. I'm telling you. 
you are kidding. So, but because the Fulanis and the Kabas have calculated, they have come to the realization that any activation of national war against the Biafran population, that they are going to have a divided house against the Biafran population. They know it. So to them, the best thing to do is to see how far are we going to hold back the individual that is going to lead if there is a need that these guys decided to to move to another state. So what are we going to do to make sure we delay the evil days? Because they know the evil days are inevitable. They are very, very, very common. But what are they going to do to extend it? And that is the background of every single politics you're seeing them playing, trying to see a way to you know, walk out of judicial process, let's see how to get this thing, you know, um, as much as we can from non-democratic approach. So the, 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 the very difficulties they are facing currently is the fact that there is no how they can mobilize the rest of Nigerians. against Biafrans and in the enjoying national cohesion. There's no how they can achieve such a common front as they had in the 70s. Because before they could realize it, within the 10 years of activities of IPOB and the messages of Mazen Namdekan, Mazen Namdekan was able to conscientize, to separate and kill the concept of Arewanism in the North, thereby bringing out the core power broker, which is the Fulani, separating them from the house and the rest of them. And that is why currently they are struggling on how to move the rest of Nigeria. So I guess therefore it's a very difficult thing. You need to achieve national cohesion first. And that is very, very important. So having said that, you cannot understand the politics of uh, come tomorrow and see Mazen Namdekan and come next tomorrow and um, see Mazen Namdekan. The truth is, the handlers of the Nigerian state are seriously on a defensive ground. And believe you me. So let's, uh, having said that, is it also important we look at what is happening uh, in Europe. Uh, is, is, is also, uh, I think, uh, a worth saying for us to understand that Europe has been the most irresponsible child of the world. I repeat, Europe has been the most irresponsible child of the world. When you talk about the most child of the world that have cost the world series of damages, it is Europe. The First World War, Europe. In fact, as a matter of fact, it was European war. The Second World War, who, where was this? How did it start? It started from Europe. And where we are heading today, where is it starting again? From Europe. So you can now understand that historically speaking, the Europeans are not civilized as they are led. They are not. Because civilization without tolerance and compromise is absolutely not civilization. And history is reached with this common factor that Europe have cost the world, the entirety of the world, more than what any other continent has ever done. Europe gave the world First World War, Europe gave the world Second World War, and Europe is also leading the world to another disaster. 
But let's look at this issue happening in Ukraine so that most of us will understand what is happening. You see, when you look at the Ukrainian crisis, it has a multifaceted approach at which, uh, you know, at which you can analyze it. Because when you fail to understand the etymology, what philosophers call etymology, with the origin of a problem or a concept, definitely you're going to lose out on your ability to give an accurate analysis on it. You see, if you look at social media, a lot of us have been talking, you know, uh, from a passive knowledge of what is happening. You see, what is happening currently in in Ukraine have a, a multi-dimensional approach uh, at which you can look at it. If you look at it from prophetic angle, you are correct. If you also look at it from economic struggle, you are correct. If you also look at it from geopolitics, you are also correct. But there is something nobody is talking about, which I will also want you to look at it from now. If you also look at it from generational analysis, generational analysis, you will also see some things you have not seen. Because people tend to talk about this um, um, this issue from one perspective or one dimension. And that's why we are getting it. We are all getting it uh, you know, we are, we are getting it from wrong perspective. You know, see, if you understand history too well, if you understand the word history too well, you will understand that there is absolutely, when I mean absolutely, there is absolutely no time Civilization has come to Europe and stabilized. If you understand what history too well, you will understand, you will agree with me that there is no time civilization has come to Europe and stabilized. What do I mean? Europeans have proven historically that they are the only human race that they built they get to the peak of their building, they start destroying. Historically speaking, the Europeans have proven historically that they are the only human race on the surface of the earth that have attained a certain level of civilization. And in foolish consensus, they start destroying what's supposed to be an accolade and the wealth for them. Let me let me shock you with some facts. Um, we have had several civilizations in Europe. We have had, uh, we have had um, Roman civilization, Roman Empire civilization. We saw how it flourished. We also saw how the Europeans themselves, who built such magnificent civilization, came in foolish consensus and destroyed it. We also have had what we call Hellenic civilization or Hellenistic civilization. We also saw how Europeans built a height of civilization. And in their foolishness, 
they also came together and destroyed it, destroyed themselves. Or are you going to talk about Greek civilization, where we saw how the Spartans were also used. The says uh, Spartans in the same highly flourishing Greek civilization also destroyed what they built for themselves. You see, uh, sometimes if I look at history, if I stray history objectively, I, I have very serious reservation to believe that the Euro class are civilized. They are not. I look at them as people who are well skilled when it comes to craftsmanship, but are bereft with the idea or the ideas and understanding of keeping what they have built for themselves. They are endowed when it comes to craftsmanship, skillful designs. But when it now comes to stabilization and keeping what they have leveled, they don't have the mental weight. They are robbed by nature to understand the mystery and the masteries of keeping one civilization. Study every civilization in Europe. If you will understand they built and they destroyed. They have never consolidated on anything. Absolutely nothing. So if you see them today bombing and destroying and threatening to escalate it from Eastern Europe to Western Europe and other parts of Europe, it is the they are blood, it runs in their vein. It runs in their vein to build and destroy. And there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do about it. If you see what happened, for instance, in um, various civilizations they have had, and how the subsequent wars they have used to destroy it. You will laugh. And the same people will tell you they are civilized. In fact, as a matter of fact, they will go ahead to tell you who is a black skin fellow that you are not civilized enough. So, what is happening in, in Ukraine today is just a particular point that have been identified as a ground of starting what we call global incineration. You know, if you want to engulf everywhere with fire, you don't just light everywhere at a time. You just drop a little match, a little spark in a unique defined point and put gasolines everywhere. From that little light or spark you drop at a particular point, it moves to other areas. And the Europeans are experts in that. In starting the process of their destruction in a very small point, they are experts. <laughs> they are experts at that. If you study their histories, you will discover that anytime they want to destroy themselves, they, they light it from a very inconsequential, or should I say, uh, something you can easily euphemize. At a point, a negligible point, I think that should be the right word. They always pack what will destroy the entire content from a negligible point. And that's exactly what they're doing in you. Uh, in Ukraine. So let's look at this issue objectively, with a clear mind, with a neutral mind, so that we understand where our world is heading to. If you, if you, if you analyze what is happening with this Western view or Eastern view, you will definitely make a whole mistake. You will arrive in a very distorted ground or result. So, all we need is to have 
a deficited mindset. Have a mindset that is neutral. So that we can now understand where and where the whole development is going to reach. And how we can key and maximize it. Take it or you leave it. Aladima Urundinze. If you look at the ancient wisdom of our fathers, they said it. We can win from the whole thing happening. We can also be foolish enough not to understand. That's why we must be meticulous, we must be logical, and above all, we must be desentimental in understanding and interpreting and also in our followership of the current international development. If you desentimentize, if you, if you de-emotionalize, then you will appreciate and enjoy every single development. So let's look at it from various angles. You know, um, USSR, which the defunct USSR ended in 1991. Some people will say 19, uh, 1990, and some people will also say 1991. But whichever what is most important here is that the defunct USSR ended after engaging in a long cold war against the West led by the United States. Make no mistake about that. And if you should ask yourself a question, why was America skeptical and opposing to the defunct USSR? America, in the same era, loved to have friendship with UK, loved to have friendship with France, loved to have friendship with others, especially in Western Europe, but never liked those of them in Eastern Europe, including Eastern Germany during the Cold War, before 1991. Ask yourself, how come about? It's a simple, let us simplify it, bring it home so that we understand. Why is it that you come to the same village, you like this person, like this person, like this person, or you hate this person, they hate this person, hate this person? It is simple. Those in Eastern Europe or under the defunct USSR, we are communists. They believe in economic and political system that centers in socialist system. Why America believes in free enterprise, free market system, capitalism. So America came to the same came to the same Europe and discovered that those of them in the Western Europe reason the same way she reasons. Have the same ideologies she had, she had or she had. And those in Eastern Europe or in the defunct USSR have a different way they see things, they reason. And they want themselves to be respected. It is the way they have chosen. They don't want anyone to, you know, tell them otherwise. They don't want absolutely no one to educate them on that. They believe that the way they see things is sacrosanct and unique for themselves. But the same Americans want those in Eastern Europe to drop the way they see things, their perspectives to lives and events. And do you know what? As a result of this contention, the United States was able to engage the USSR, the defunct USSR, on what we call Cold War. 
In fact, as a matter of fact, it's important you understand history so that you don't keep on being allowed to be fooled. And we are aware that both the defunct USSR and the United States, they formed understanding together and fought against Hitler in 1945, during the Second World War. These two opposing nations, or opposing ideologies, fought Hitler. They were friends, they joined hand together, defeated Hitler. Now the problem began after the defeat of Hitler, when they began to ask themselves, Onyega Chizese, we have removed the known enemy, two of us who are supposed to now be the king. It was at that point, their distrust, their own enemies began to rise. Because when they defeated Hitler, the USSR believed that her own ideology should be flourished especially within the Eastern Europe and Europe. United States, in another hand, believes that she needs to export her own ideology across the Pacific, not just within the Western Hemisphere, but beyond Western Hemisphere, down to the entire Europe, Africa, and other parts of the world. And even including the defunct USSR, the communist USSR. And while she was trying to do this, the defunct USSR was strongly in opposition with that. And problem arose among these fellows. So what America did was to carry out a blackmailing campaign, doing everything to demonize socialism, doing everything to demonize communism, doing everything possible to give a satanic image on anything that is not capitalism oriented. So in course of trying to do this and threatening USSR, take note of this, because the USSR, the defunct USSR, understand that America is the only country on Earth till tomorrow, take note of this, that have ever used nuclear weapon on another man's soil. America, no country has beaten America on that, on that record. America is the only country on Earth that left her own continent, came to another man's continent, dropped a nuclear weapon. If you don't know where it happened, it happened in Hiroshima and Nagagaska. Madagascar, uh, Nagagaska, I mean to say. In Japan, in today's Japan. So, USSR felt that the same America that was so wicked to have done this, not minding the lives of civilians in Japan, that the same America can descend when they decide to also nuke them. Do you know what happened? USSR began to build nuclear armament. She began to spend a whole lot of money in building nuclear defenses or uh, defense lines. But remember, why she was building all those things? It was a heavy weight on her economy. She needed to view those things as a deterrent against America's rascality and drunkenness. So that America will understand that any day she resorts to nuke any of the defunct USSR soil, she will understand that USSR also have the nuclear capability to also nuke any part of the United States.
So he, he, he is called power equilibrium in political analysis. Power equilibrium. Power equilibrium is a, a natural way of arriving at what we call determined. What is power equilibrium? If I know you have a gun and I have a gun, same gun, you have a K47, I have a K47, I will be careful how I molest you. I will be careful how I treat you. It's called power equilibrium. When people attain the same level of armament, they will be cautious. And that's why you see everybody just careful with what is happening in Ukraine. Because every actor on that stage is a nuclear possessor. From France, from Britain, from United States, from China, from what have you, Russia. And from others who might be interested to join. Majority of them are nuclear warhead possessors. So because of that, everybody is trying to have a sound calculation before going mad on each other. If it is a minor African country, believe in me, it's a three-week operation. America will just get rid of. So what? <laughs> what, what if, it's a, if it's a country that is not a nuclear possessor, America would have been wrong. But America is conscious, knowing too well that if she miscalculates, the story of Armageddon, which is the end of the world, can easily come within two weeks. Within two weeks, everything on the surface of the earth will just float on the soil without anybody burying each other. Because when everybody is dead, who buries each other? <laughs> so America, America is very extremely careful in this issue. But that is not really where we are, because we are trying to give a historical analogy of everything. So, the USS began to build, build uh, uh, you know, a deterrence. That is a weapon of def defensive lines. So, what America did, America understood that they, she is already on a high level in terms of what she has, she began to lure USSR into more building. You see, she, she made USSR to divert over 50% of her resources in building of weapons. Now, look at the, the, the economic implication of arm raids. When a country builds AK-47, or when a country buys AK-47, let me use a clear indication, like in Nigeria, for instance. Any time Nigeria spends 50 kobo in arm purchase, that money is useless. Do you know why it's useless? Because an arm we build up, arm does not give you economic growth. It's just like you use your money to go and buy stone to keep in their house. The stone does not have any economic value. And any single bullet you shoot, bam, is a wastage. You have just, you have just emptied your resources to a thin air. So what America did was to lure USSR into a race by creating an impression that she is building more dangerous one. So the default U.S. was trying to measure up with America by building also, diverting the money she would have used to build various facilities and other things. Diverting it to building nuclear weapons. When they build those nuclear weapons will just be on that place. You have spent billions of dollars and they are lying down there. You are not trading on them. They are just there. It's just like you dumping your money. You would have used for something better. So America lured the defunct USSR into arm race, and the defunct USSR, in trying to measure up with America, get to a point that she could not survive again because she has diverted money she would have used for the betterment, for the welfare of her citizens, 
into building an arm that no war is even before her to fight. Do you now understand? So, because she got into that stage, she began to suffer economic problems. And because she was exposed to economic pains, she did what we call liberalization. She began to introduce non-communist ideas in her system. She began to adopt a little pattern of capitalism in her political system. That little introduction of a strange system led to the collapse of the defunct USSR. So don't forget how America Lord Lord uh, the defunct US into arm race. And that's exactly what the strategy they're also playing on China. So when USSR collapsed, the current Ukraine you're seeing, listen and listen very carefully, was one of the places they had. The, the defunct USA, but the USA, the defunct USA is made up of a lot of countries in Eastern Europe, including this Ukraine. So when she collapsed, a lot of them had their independence. A lot of them pulled out and began to adopt capitalist systems. Some of them began to look towards those in the Western Europe for friendship and began to discard every iota of communism and socialism. So this current Ukraine you're seeing happens to be where that defunct USSR had one of the best factories for weapon makings, including nuclear. If you remember, there is a place we call Chinobi. If you remember, there is a place we call Chinobi that had the nuclear crisis issue in 1984 or 1985. Do you understand me? So, this current Ukraine happens to be a part of the defunct USSR where the USSR had one of the major armament making places. So, what happens is that when they collapse, listen, America came into this place and um, managed to destroy a lot of equipment centers and all this. And the current Russia became her own country. Every other country became their own country. Do you know what? You see, most of us I have written on, I have, sorry, I have read so many of us who say, we make a short note, we say, uh, Ukraine was given her freedom and it gets to another people, uh, uh, she refused. No, no, you don't understand. Nobody gave Ukraine freedom. Moscow never gave Ukraine freedom. Ukraine, like any other member of the defunct USSR, got their freedom as a result of the collapse of the defunct USSR. So you can also say Russia also got freedom. Just the way Ukraine got. So nobody gave each other. You see, the importance of educating the Biafran population so that we understand the reality, things, the way it is. When people say uh, Ukraine is greedy, she, she was given a freedom and when it gets to other people, she, no, 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 nobody gave Ukraine freedom. Ukraine freedom was as a result of circumstances. The center collapsed and everybody worked out in home. Just the way the Nigerian system, the center is in a very big mess. The economic is in the shambles. So if it collapses and the Biafras walk away, the Dudua people walk away, maybe middle bed walk away, and tomorrow you say the House of Lani gave middle bed freedom. No. Everybody walk away because the central force got weakened. So for us, most of us to understand, that narrative is really, really wrong. It's historically fictitious to say that. So what now happened is that 
Um, America now began to see what uh, when Russia collapsed. America agreed. You see, um, when Russia collapsed, the, when we talk about Russia, I'm talking about the defunct USSR. Defunct. Because the Russia that collapsed is not this current Russia. Ru this current Russia is a remnant. They decide to return Russia in their name. Just, that, just the way anybody can return Nigeria at the end of everything. If the person desires, anyway. So what am I trying to say? So when that happened, America assured this part that kept answering Russia that America will not in any way attack her. That America in a, will not in any way threaten her security. This is what America showed. She said, okay, America, for you to say this, we are going to give you access to Ukraine, some of our equipment, our assets in, in Ukraine, because we are retaining the name Russia. Because we are retaining the name of the, uh, the name Russia, some of the assets in Ukraine that was built under the name of Russia, we give you access to them. In as much as you have promised not in any way to pose a threat to us, the, the, it was um, agreed. Now, what happened? America began, first of all, began to export Western ideology in this part of the world. That was the first war America took. The same America that assured them of non belligerency The same America that told them that she was not going to be a belligerent actor or threat to Russia. The first thing America did was the exportation of a cultural ideology. Do you know what America did? America, first of all, go and research what I'm telling you. Go and make a research. What America did first was Americans began to buy a lot of Russian babies. Does that make sense to you? A lot of Russian babies were adopted. As you know, when you say you are adopting babies, American secret agencies ship a lot of Russians, Russian babies to America that adopted them officially. Just the way you say you are adopting a baby, secretly adopted them, ship them to America, westernize them from infancy, expose them to an opposing ideology with what is happening from where they were born and use them mostly in foreign missions in Russia. And they look, they are Russians in skin, in look, but Americans in mind. So when the Russian government discovered this, they put an embargo, they, they, they place another that no American should adopt a Russian baby. Do you know what America moved from that state and began to sponsor civil society organizations, a lot of groups in Russia. This America, don't make a mis don't forget it. Don't, uh, don't forget this. This America that pledged in writing non belligerency. When that was busted, the next thing America did was start sponsoring a lot of civil society organizations and groups, NGOs in Russia to be attacking the government policies. Whatever the Russian government says, they will attack it. And these are Russians, American group, to, to, to make sure that 
the Russian system are weakened through raising people within her as an opposition. And do you know what happened? <laughs> Putin arrested a lot of these people, jailed them, and America could not save them. What America did was to sanction them. When that plot failed, remember I've told you the first plot. The first plot was adoption of a uh, of adoption, I'm not talking about adoption, I'm talking official legal adoption, not kidnapping. That is not the one I'm talking about, of Russian babies. I've not told you about the civil society organizations and doctors. When that was busted and a lot of these people were, were proscribed to be workers of foreign agencies, you know, by Russian government. Do you know what America? <laughs> America did. You know, you don't, most of you don't understand the how power hunger United States is. Most of us don't understand. That does not mean that putting decision is the right one. But remember, I told us we have to be objective in our analysis so that we understand, so that we don't we don't fight mad people's fights. So when that was busted, the next thing America did was to start throwing money among those countries that were former members of the defunct USSR, like Poland, Georgia, Ukraine, Finland, a lot of them. America began to pump a lot of money and began to tell them that they should start considering joining the European Union and NATO. And you know what happens? When you are a member of NATO, by the virtue of being a member of NATO, you will allow your soil to host NATO armament or weapons. So America, we are telling these people, come, if you want us to help you, you have to consider joining Europe. You have to consider joining NATO. Because these people, something happened. And that is why this war you're seeing is bigger than Putin. I want to tell you a part of the narrative that nobody will tell you. And that, why, that is why the war is bigger than Putin. It's bigger than Joe Biden. It's bigger than anybody. You see what happened? After the USSR ended, the Western nations began to run a program, a very funny program. I don't want to say it's dangerous, but a funny program. What is that program? Start attracting use of this defunct USSR she began to attract them to Europe. When they are used one after, during the holidays, there are a lot of European agencies, traveling agencies, that will give them a free holiday visit to Europe. So while these youth and students were moving down to Europe, they were exposed with European lifestyles and not Soviet lifestyles. Is what is called mental work. If you if you work on the mind of a man, you own him without chaining him. So what happened is that a lot of these youths were shipped down to Europe and exposed to the cultures and values of Europe, and their youth began to love everything about Europe. So when Americana said to them, "Can't can't you consider joining Europe?" Can't you consider joining NATO? If the, the, if the government of these countries began to put those considerations into referendum or plebiscite, their youth, which have a reasonable population, will vote in support of their country joining Europe and NATO. Courtesy of CIA and other secret agencies' mental work on this use.
the youth were exposed to a Western life, and the Western countries come back, push their government and say, consider this, put it on referendum, put it on plebiscite. When they subject these ideologies on plebiscite, the same youth who have gone to Europe and see her life of Europe began to ask their government, be a member of European Union so that we don't go under immigration hurdles in going to that place. So that we don't go through stress in order to in order to be. So that was how most of this country. And you know, Mars is the rest of your wake up. That is how a lot of these countries we are lured into joining Europe. And one thing uh, joining Europe and uh, uh, NATO. But remember, <laughs> if you join, you must expose yourself to host NATO armament. So to the United States, listen and listen very carefully. To the United States, she needed all these countries to be a member of NATO, not, uh, not Atlantic Treaty Organization. That is what NATO means. You know, why United States want these countries around Russia to join NATO is because she wants to host missiles in all these countries. Those missiles are going to be facing Russia. Do you, do you, <laughs> do you understand how this thing works? So, because she understands that if there is any war against Russia, she needs to have a close launch pad. It's called geographical proximity to the enemy. And that is exactly what she wants to achieve. She wants to achieve two things with that. She wants one, that any time Russia looks towards Poland and sees that Poland is hosting a lot of NATO missiles facing her. She will draw back in her action. She wants to use it as a weapon of engagement. So that anytime they are telling Russia, Russia do this, and Russia is doing head like this, they will say to Russia, remember in Poland, we have social number of armament. In Finland, we have social. In Sweden, you know, start mentioning countries that encircled Russia. It's a kind of psychological warfare. So, in course of time, of course, the United States was able to get these things achieved by learning a lot of countries, neighboring countries of Russia to NATO and membership of European Union. But what now got Russian smart is this. United States decided to come to Ukraine and Ukraine is the most closest point to Moscow, to St. Petersburg and other wonderful cities of Russia. You see, the, the United States did it in Poland, did it in Georgia, did it, did it in several places, and Russia seemed to have collected that. You see, she now decided to advance further in Ukraine to have them as a member of members of NATO, member of NATO, uh, okay, uh, not Atlantic Organization Treat uh, Organization, I mean to say. And Russia said, no, you can't do this. You can't tell us we are going to have a neighbor that is going to host enemies with us. You cannot do that. And guess what? Every single moment Russia tells them what you're doing, you are threatening us, you are encircling us, 
you are you are warranting us every single time russia says this to them they go back and drink coffee laughing without knowing the implications of what they are doing the more russia complains the more they are provoking her more with their moves so what russia did was in ukraine and other neighboring countries there are places you have russian population in georgia you have some part of georgia that have reasonable russian ethnic population in ukraine the same thing happens in ukraine in poland and all the rest of them so what russia had the only option russia has was to ask the russians in this part of the parts of these countries to seek self-determination that they should seek independence outside this country so that when they get independent russia can use their soil as a launch pad against those neighboring countries who are ready to work with the enemy and that was what happened in eastern ukraine it also happened in georgia two parts two parts of uh, georgia broke away and russia recognized them also helped them and fought for their self-determination in ukraine russia also did say in eastern ukraine now that is where we are today and somebody might be interested to know what might be the possible reaction of the western allies and this is where i want us to be very very rational and thinking if anybody is telling you that the west are going to keep quiet my friend you get it wrong if anybody is telling you that the west are bullied or threatened not to do anything you get it wrong let me not tell you the difference between the west and the east when you look at eastern powers talking about russia china and all the rest of them in the case of china the leader of the communist party or the people's party as the case may be my wake up gather only 15 people and they take decision to launch war that is how their political system is in russia what putin needs is to gather his generals not even going to the parliament he will gather the general and authorize them on what to do that is the way their system work but in the western countries it's not that way joe biden cannot authorize war without consulting the members of the congress in fact as a matter of fact beyond the congress they have to make sure that american reasonable opinions are favorable to that war they want him back some applies to uk some applies to france the western system of engagement in war is different from what you see in russia so what are the western nations doing they know they cannot embark on this war without first of all getting the sympathy of their own population and how do they get this sympathy by creating artificial scenario which is not real provoking russia to launch attack in ukraine then they will go to ukraine and start picking various pictures se selected pictures where they will say yeah, russia bombed this and the child was saying to russia why are you killing my parents they will be shipping those pictures home to american population to european western european population and their citizens will be mad at russia and start telling their government what the hell are you doing putin is committing war crimes you need to go in and save civilians, save women, defenseless women, save the def defenseless children. And most of you don't understand, it is just how the Western nations work. They first of all want to battle you on media space, demonize you, criminalize you. Then they will fight you ruthlessly in a way that you never forget it. In fact, they will, they, will, they, will be, they, they will play their game very intelligently that 
even though they are in the midst of the war, they can never elect any president that is not talking to continue that war. Because the population is a, a population that, that has already been brainwashed with false narratives and presentation. So what you are seeing today is just preliminary section of what is to come. The West are very smart. They are very dangerous. They are first of all trying to make Putin to be the aggressor. Do you understand? They are trying to make Putin to look as if an aggressor. So that when people are telling the stories, nobody will talk about how the Western nations were busy barantine encircling Russia with her missiles. No, people will cut off that story. And the story will start from Russia invaded a sovereign state, Ukraine, and was killing innocent children and women. And that is why the Western nation, in support of freedom and def in defense of humanity, decided to go into the war. So that, that is how the historians will start writing in the future. That what caused the uh, Third World War was Putin's genocide in Ukraine. Nobody will start from where we just give a chronological analysis how the whole thing is developing. So you have to understand how the Western nations work. If anybody is telling you that the NATO mini current military buildup within Poland and not the rest of them is for mere display. You are joking. And let me say this to us. Very, very important to understand this. When it comes to war, not those who started can't win it. All you require is strategy. And believe you me, the West are trying to <laughs> do you know their first um it is they are they want to cut off this broadcast i don't know maybe i'm diving into a very sensitive session because it's gradually drawing down but that is by the way anyway we we might not really go to deeper issues because I understand the clues I'm diving into. You know, the way they, as I speak to you, because they are currently on media projects. And they just imagine me coming to give a narrative, chronological explanation of how I don't think they will be happy. Because it contradicts how they want the story to be told. And I'm here trying to. So if. The program stops. Understand that it just have to stop. You know, you, you understand me. So, um, so that is that is by the way. Um, so, I think maybe we we come next time because I feel at this moment this program is a consign to some powers that be at this very moment. We will keep on as much as we come. We come online. We do this, but you should understand <laughs> what, we, what we need. What we need. This word is just a very dirty word. Anyway, it's really dirty. You see. So what we need is just to understand what is happening. If you understand what is happening, you you uh, <laughs> you understand how the world is being governed. Anyway, so. This is the time you must think out of bus because much is coming. Forget the deceptive cards the Western nations are playing. You see, most of us never understood. There's something happened recently, and somebody was asking me, somebody said to me, Chica Austin, I don't you think Western intelligence were, uh, were accurate when they say Russia was going to invade? And Russia invaded. And I said to the person, you don't understand something, you don't understand what played out. 
the Western intelligence gave a report that Russia was going to uh, invade. Not because they were sure that Russia was going to invade. Not because they were sure. Rather, they were sure that with the level of provocation they have planned on Russia, that Russia will have no other option than to invade. I want us to understand how these things work. Not because they know that Russia has planned for my life to invade. No, they know that with the kind of provocation we are going to give Russia, if they are going to say, let us discuss, we are going to now show them more military build up, they will have no other option than to invade. So they were telling you that with what they are going to do, with the kind of provocation we are going to give Russia, Russia will invade. Not because they are telling you that Russia has planned to invade. No. You, you must understand the world. The world is a very, it's not, it's not really how you see it on the surface. So um, that is just how it is. I know most people, because when I watch internet, some people will bring that picture of nuclear warhead. In fact, as a matter of fact, you have to guide your mind. I'm sorry to say this, but I just have to say it, especially to the Biafran population. Some of the videos and pictures you're seeing coming out from Ukraine are incidents that happened in the Middle East. But because Putin has to be criminalized, he has to be demonized before the final hitting on him comes in. Do you understand me? You must, uh, you must understand what we are talking about. This is basically an ideological battle. And every agency, international uh, intelligence agencies all over the world are working around the clock now. They, none of them are resting. Because everyone is fighting for global consensus. And for those of you who think China will just dumble into this issue, you're getting it wrong. You are simply getting it wrong. Because China on itself also have their own disagreement with Russia. Forget the screen display. In fact, there is a region, there is a land dispute between China and Russia. And all these things are all about interest. Nobody loves each other. What the West are doing in Eastern Europe is not because they love those of them in Eastern Europe, but because they want to curtail the expansion of Russia. They don't want Putin to build up the defunct USSR because they feel that it's part of their pride, it's part of their history, that they were the ones that destroyed the defunct They don't want what they have destroyed to rise up again. Not because they love Ukrainians, not because they love the Polish people, the Polish people or the Georgians. Make no mistake about that. And if you think that China will just dumble into an issue like this, no, 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 you get it wrong. China also have her own regional problem. China also have. And the worst thing that can ever happen to the Russians is to depend on China alone. You understand me? <laughs> is it doesn't happen that way? China also have to also make a sound analysis of the cost to her national interest first. Very very important. So we must understand things the way we are. So uh, we will come to the end of this program this evening, uh, and uh, we have to understand that the current crisis in Ukraine has already messed up the remaining economic life of the Nigerian state. Because the high price of energy 
is a threat to her survival. So we just have to be strong because the issue of freedom is not a social media thing, like most of us take it. It's, not, it's beyond you waking up or being on your comfort bed and type and post. It's beyond, far beyond it. Far beyond it. And that is what most of us have not really understood. Neither is it something of sentiment, weeping of sentiments and all this. So we must be strong. When I mean strong, we must be strong. We must be strong. People who are not mentally tough cannot, in any way, as a matter of fact, achieve anything in life. So I want to thank every single one of us who joined this evening program, and most especially um, Mazi Sylvester, who was <laughs> agitating for late notifications anyway. So we must uh, be strong and okay, okay. We bless us. Uh, thank you so much and do enjoy yourself.